uh, take out the tan insert in your bulletin today, kind of follow along a lot of scriptures that we want to look at as we continue our series. Uh, a guy was driving a, a tr- uh, driving a car, and he was following a, a, pet, a pet truck store, a uh, pet store truck delivery, delivery truck. Man, I'm going to get that right one of these times. Anyway, you get the gist. Here's this pet store delivery truck. Okay. And here was the amazing thing, though. Every time it came to a stoplight, the guy in the truck would jump out of his, uh, jump out of his car, uh, truck, and he, he had a two before, and he'd bang on the side of the truck. And the guy thought, well, that's weird. And he jumped back in his car, uh, car, uh, truck, and the light changed, and got to the next stoplight and did the very same thing. This happened for four stoplights, and the guy said to himself, next time I'm going to just get out of my car and say, what in the world are you doing? And so that's what he did. And the guy said, oh, listen, man, I got four tons of canaries in here. It's a two-ton truck. I got to keep half those canaries in the air all the time. (laughs) Do you ever feel like that's what your life is like? You know, you're just overwhelmed, and you've got all these things going, and you're, you're trying to keep everything balanced, and you're working so hard to keep all those things in the air from crashing down around you. See, I think we have a tendency to get stuck in a vicious circle in life, stuck in relationships, stuck in habits, stuck in grief or anger, in some addiction, and this vicious cycle is something we just can't seem to get out of, and once you get stuck, then you start feeling guilty. I wish I could get out of this, but I can't. And the guilt piles up because you can't seem to change. And then you get angry with yourself. I ought to be able to stop this. I ought to be able to get out of this. I ought to be able to manage this. But you don't. And then your anger begins to turn to fear. I'm never going to get out of this. It's got control of me. I don't know what to do. And then your, 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 your fear eventually turns to depression. You find yourself you know, feeling sorry for yourself, you know, having a pity party, and and finally you just kind of give up. I, I can't, I can't change. And that cycle just continues. How do you break out of that rut? Jesus wants to set us free. How do you break out of that rut? That's what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. We've, We've looked at two steps. Step one, admit I've got a problem. I got all these canaries and I don't have enough truck for them. You know, that's the reality step. I admit I've got a problem. I realize I'm not God, and I admit I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. That's the the powerless step. And then step two is the hope step. That first one kind of makes you feel helpless. Not only am I powerless, but God has the power, and He is willing to help me. He knows everything going on in my life. And he cares about me. He cares about my problems. He cares about about me. He cares about what I'm going through. He wants to help me change. And so that step says, I earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him. He cares about me and that he has the power to help me recover. But see, it's not enough just to know that God will help you. Any more than it's enough for your kids to know that you can help them. They've got to accept that help. You've got to accept that help from God. You've got to take action. Today we're going to talk about a decision that you have to make. That that, that second step of God's power gives me hope. But the third step is I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to His care and control. I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to His care and control. That's what I call the resignation step where we resign as the manager of our universe. And this step is based on Jesus' promise in Matthew 11. I just read it this morning in my quiet time. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Put my yoke upon you. In other words, be united with me and learn from me. He has so much He wants to teach us. For I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my load is light. Jesus invites us, come to me. He says, I'll lighten your load. You'll have relief and rest and rejuvenation. Give me the care and control of your life and watch what I do. Life will get so much easier, so much less stressful. What a deal. Why would anybody turn that down? And yet some of you have heard this before. And you've never acted on it. It's kind of like having an unopened gift. God says, I want to give you this gift of relief. 
of rest, of, of unburdening your life with all that stress. I want to give this to you. Recovery. And you've not done anything about it. Well, there's something that must be keeping us from taking this step, making this decision. What is it? What causes me to procrastinate giving my problems to God? What causes me to delay surrendering my life to the care and control of the one who created me and loves me more than I even love myself? Well, number one, pride. Pride will keep me from admitting I need help. Jesus said, This series, you know, is based in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verse 5. Jesus said, blessed are those who are free of pride. The Bible says arrogant people are on their way to ruin because they won't admit it when they need help. The self-sufficient fool falls flat on his face. It's amazing how much pain we endure because we are too proud to admit that we need help help from outside, that we can't do it on our own. Secondly, guilt will cause us to keep from taking this step. I may be ashamed to ask God to help me. Psalm 40 verse 12 says, problems too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. Meanwhile, my sins, too many to count, have caught up with me, and I'm ashamed to look up. You ever felt that way? You ever said, you know how many times I've asked God for help, and I've made a promise, and I've broken that promise? God, if you just get me out of this, I'm embarrassed to ask God for help. You don't know all the things that I've done wrong. I couldn't go to God and ask for his help. Listen, you're dead wrong. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. He wants to help you, just like you want to help your children. Don't let pride or guilt keep you from taking this step. He wants to forgive your guilt. And thirdly, fear and worry will stop me from moving to the next level. What are you afraid of if you commit your life to Christ? If you give God the care and control of your life, what are you afraid of? You say, I don't want anybody controlling me. Listen, who are you kidding? You're being controlled all the time. You're controlled by the opinions of other people. You're controlled by what they say and think. You're controlled by the hurts that you can't forget from your past. You're controlled by habits. You're controlled by hang-ups. You're controlled by the way your parents raised you. The Bible says everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And Jesus says, I want to set you free. You know what real freedom is? Would you write this down on that outline? There's a spot for it. Real freedom is choosing who controls you. That's the only freedom we have. Every person is a slave. We're either a slave to sin or a slave to God. We have a choice, and we can choose who controls us. When you resign as the manager of your life and let God control your life, you give your life to the care and control of Jesus, he sets you free. Jesus promised this. If you live by what I say, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Bob Dylan saying, you've got to serve somebody. He recognized it. Real freedom is choosing who our master will be. So what are you afraid of? What are you holding on to that you think, I can't let go of that and give my life to God? I can't let go of that relationship or that ambition or that habit or that lifestyle or that possession. Jesus said, what do you benefit? If you gain the whole world, all the possessions you want, every relationship you have a desire for. You gain the whole world and lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul, than your life? When you take this third step, you're basically surrendering to Jesus. You're giving everything to him. And then you never had it so good because he takes what you've given him, he turns it around, he adds new meaning, new significance, new vitality, and he gives it back to you to use in a whole new way. If you've been afraid to open your life to the care and control of Christ, afraid that that he might make you some religious fanatic, listen, Jesus is opposed to religious fanatics, all right? Get that down. Jesus wants people that are devoted and in love with him. He wants us to love him supremely more than anything else in this world. 
He's not looking for religious fanatics. Or if you think you might have to give up some cherished sin, don't worry about the specifics of what you might have to give up. If you focus on those specifics, you'll never make the greater decision, which is the step to freedom. Just come to God and say, God, I don't even know what I need to give up, but I do know I want my life under your care and control because you love me and you created me and you know what's best for me. So God, here's my life. And you give God a blank check. If your child, think about this, if your kid came to you tomorrow, say he's 13, 14 years old, and he or she just came to you and jumped into your lap and they said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to do everything you want me to do. I realize how intelligent, how smart you are, how much more wisdom you have than I have. Now, all you parents know that you are way smarter than your children. You have far more wisdom than you do. I'm not making a joke. It's true. If the kids would just understand that. And, and, they, and so this kid finally gets it. Here he is, 13 years old. I'm giving myself completely to you to follow you, to do what you want me to do. What would you do, okay? I mean, after you picked yourself up off the floor. Now, there's, there's the joke. What would you do? Let me tell you what you wouldn't do. You wouldn't say to yourself, wow, that's great. Boy, am I going to make life miserable for this kid. She's going to be at my beck and call. No more chores or drudgery for me. Whatever I hate to do, I'm giving it to her. You would, you know, you wouldn't do that at all, would you? You would be delighted that she wants to obey you because you love her so much. And you would rejoice because you know that by him following your guidelines and your direction and your advice, they would avoid all kinds of hurt and pain and problems and difficulties that you went through because of the stupid and foolish decisions that you made. You would do all you could to make that child's life fruitful and fulfilling and satisfying so that they could avoid all the pain that you've gone through in your own life. Now, you just multiply that a thousandfold with God. He loves you more than any parent could ever love you. And he knows far more than any of us know. We don't ever need to fear committing our life to the care and control of God because everything he asks of us is for our benefit and in our best interest. So we can give God a blank check. There's no need to fear. Let him take care of the rest. 42 years ago, I took that step. I said yes to Jesus, and I didn't understand all the implications for my future, but I decided the best possible life for me was to open my life to the care and control of the guy who made me, who created all this, because I figured he knows best, and I've never regretted that decision. There have been times when I've regretted not following everything he said, but I've never regretted that decision and following Jesus. In fact, many times a week, I still thank God for setting me free and for the way he's working in my life. And every morning, 365 days a year, I say to Jesus, Lord, I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to your care and control. I do that 365 days a year in my quiet time. One of the first things I do. It's important that you and I realize the Christian life is a decision followed by a process. You decide, today we're talking about the decision. You decide to commit your life to Christ's care and control. You decide initially, August 28th, 1972 is when I made that decision initially, but then I decide every day. And from that point on, he is working to transform your life, to change you from the inside out until Christ is formed in you, till you reach that goal of maturity. It's a decision followed by this process. In World War II, the Marines had a definite strategy they used when they went to retake the Pacific from the Japanese. They used the same strategy on every island, and it worked every single time. They would, they would first go to that island and pelt it with bombs and explosives, and they call that the softening up period. I believe that some of you are in the softening up period right now in your life. All kinds of explosions are going off around you. 
sending fragments everywhere, and you, and you realize this isn't working. My life's not working. It's not where I need it to be. I need something beyond myself. God is softening up your pride to where you're ready to admit, I need some help from outside of myself. I need something beyond myself. I need God's help. I need to deal with this stress. I can't keep all these canaries flying at the same time. And then in the second, te- second phase, the Marines would land and they would establish a beachhead. Maybe only 20 yards deep and, and 200 yards wide, but they would get a presence on that island. And when the Marines had established a beachhead there, had they liberated the island? No. No, they had just gotten in. From there, they began to fight the battles. Sometimes they would move forward. Sometimes they'd be pushed backward. Sometimes they'd win the battle. Sometimes they'd lose a battle. But everybody knew in World War II, once the Marines had established a beachhead, total liberation of that island was just a matter of time. Because in the history of World War II, the Marines landed and established a beachhead, and they never lost an island. Eventually, that entire island would be set free. When you take this third step, when you make that decision to daily give God the care and control of your life, God gets a beachhead in your life. When you make that first decision, He lands in your life. The Bible calls it conversion, being born again. God gets a presence in my life. That doesn't mean that everything is peachy keen, that, that, that everything is great. That just means God's in my life, He's there. And for the rest of my life, he's going to be working to set me free little by little. It's a process. And that's why we can trust God completely. When we love him supremely, we can trust him completely to do what he says. See, maybe you worry that that in this battle, you won't be able to hold on. You just keep going. Don't worry. The Bible says, leave all your worries and anxieties with him because he cares for you. He holds you in his hand, the Bible tells us. You know, when you you got little kids, some of you, or grandkids, and let's say you're walking across a busy street and you grab a hold of their hands, and they're squirming and trying to pull, you know, they're trying to pull out. You still hold on to their hands. Why? Because you love them. You care about them. You want to protect them. You want to help them. Well, once you've grabbed onto God's hand, he holds onto yours, and he won't let go. Scripture says, amazing promise, he is able to keep that which I have committed to him. You commit your life, your will, to the care and control of God. He has promised to keep it, to protect you, to enable you. The Bible says God who began this good work in you will keep right on helping you grow in his grace until his task within you is finally finished. It's a decision followed by a process until he brings you to maturity in Christ. So don't let worry and fear keep you from surrendering your life to Christ. And then don't let doubt keep you from commitment to Christ. You might be saying, well, I want to believe, but my faith just seems so small. Well, let me tell you a little story that Jesus told in the Bible about a guy whose son would get these seizures that would nearly kill him. So he brought his son to Jesus so Jesus could heal him, and he tells Jesus his story, and at the end of his story, he says to Jesus, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible. And look at what the Bible says. Immediately, the boy's father cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. All of us have been there. Where we we believe, but there's this little speck of doubt, or there's there's a little bit of, of question. And God says, say that prayer. That was enough for Jesus. It was good enough for Jesus. He healed the boy. And so maybe you need to say to God, God, I want to believe that you can deliver me, that you can strengthen me, that you're going to help me. And please help me with that unbelief. And that's good enough. See, you don't have to have a giant faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as, uh, the size of a grain of a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible to you. It's not the size of your faith that matters. It's the size of what you put your faith in. It's the size of your God. 
You can have a giant faith in the wrong thing and get no results. Faith is not the issue. The issue is what you put your faith in. If I, I've got a chair over there in my office. I was going to bring it out here, but I thought, oh, it'll take extra time. It's got a broken leg. If I invited you to come up here and sit on that chair, it wouldn't matter how much faith you had. You know, Chris, you could say, I believe that chair is going to hold me up. I'm going to sit down, and I tell you, you'll fall flat on your butt. You know, there's, that's no way it's going to hold it up. See, our faith is only as good as what we put it in. And when we put our faith in a big God, he re- responds and gives big results. See, man has made faith some deep, esoteric, undefinable issue in the back of our mind. Faith is, very, is a very simple thing in Scripture. It is our positive response to what God has said or declared. God said to Abraham, move away from Ur. He moved. And he was known as a man of great faith. God said to Jeremiah, speak to Israel. He spoke. He was known as a man of great faith. Jesus said to the paralytic, get up. And he got up. Faith is as simple as that. To realize that faith is simply your response to something God says or does takes the pressure off of you and enables you to adopt a more constructive attitude toward faith. Don't look inside yourself and say, how much faith do I have? Look to God and say, what is God saying to me? What is God asking me to do? What is the next step that I need to take? And you take it. You do what God is telling you to do. When Jesus praised the great faith of different people in the Bible, he was not praising some mystical inner state. He was commenting on a concrete action by which somebody responded to him. Jesus spoke, and they responded. They acted. And once you you understand this, you begin to realize why the amount of faith you have is a less crucial issue than you might have thought. That saying of of Jesus about the grain of mustard seed begins to make sense. Listen, here's the point. We don't need to ask for faith big enough to move mountains. We need a faith big enough to move us. One step at a time. It's a process by which God develops us. Faith is simply your decision to respond to God's word. So God says something and you respond. Jesus promised that he'll forgive your past. He'll provide power and purpose for your present. He'll give you a fabulous future with him forever if you surrender your heart and your life and your will to him. Don't let any of these things, pride, guilt, fear, worry, or doubt, keep you from taking this step. I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to his care and control. Now, some of you may be thinking, I tried that. I tried giving my life to God, and it just didn't work. Last week I said, the problem with that is you may have made him and asked him to be resident in your life. Jesus doesn't want to be resident. What's he want to be? President. He wants to be president in your life. He wants to be Lord. You didn't make a commitment of your whole life and will to Christ. You were a little bit like the kamikaze pilot that went on 33 missions. Go ahead and think about that for a minute. See, he was involved, but he wasn't committed. Don't let anything keep you from taking this step. I want you to hear Chris Plemons as she shares her story about the steps she took to God and to be set free. Hello, my name is Chris, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with self-worth, depression, and codependency. I dragged my family to Valley View Christian Church Easter of 2013. Thankfully, they attended with me. I felt instantly welcomed here. Feeling that my family was falling apart, I somehow managed to get them back for Mother's Day that, that year. My family is really struggling, so... About mid-July of that year, I found myself really seeking help and started searching the internet and found a group, Celebrate Recovery. It was very hard to um, make that initial contact. And when, when I looked at the nearest location, what came up? Valley View Christian Church. And, I, and so I sent the um, website an email. And with minutes, just minutes, Jeff Lang was on the phone. The phone rang. I remember thinking, I just asked God for help, and the phone rang. Of course, I asked some of my questions. Would I see people that I know? 
and he's like, yes, you will. You will know people that, that come to church or to celebrate recovery. You need to come for your benefits and for your hurts and hangups and habits. But I knew when I got off the phone, I was going to the meeting on Thursday for Celebrate Recovery. I remember leaving that, the house that night on Thursday and actually I got sick before I came. It just was, I was scared and I was instantly welcomed by people, felt comfortable enough to stay. And I really realized that these people were real and they had the same hurts and hangups and habits that I did. God had a plan for me, there was no doubt about it. Um, I started the women's step study about six, six weeks after that, which is an intense um, study of 12 steps. About the fifth step, my husband Alan fell ill again, and um, this time he would not recover. He passed away on November 8th of that year, leaving me with three kids and um, and a lot, a lot of hurts. I remember thinking when he passed, that God had a plan and that I needed to trust in that plan. And I, I had this wonderful Celebrate Recovery family around me to help me and um, just to be there with me. One of the things that I so remember feeling from them was that if you keep working these steps, you will get some consistency in your life. Some of those hurts will start feeling better and you'll start working through some of that pain. With Alan's passing, all three of my sons, Cody, Austin, and Dylan, all sought out the Lord and are now actively in church, which is just such a blessing. It's just been nine months since he passed, um, but our lives have changed forever. I now am a leader at Celebrate Recovery. I continue to work the 12 steps. I was baptized in January, and I just wanna help anyone who has a struggle, a hurt, a hang up, or a habit. We all need Celebrate Recovery. It's for you and me. Thank you for letting me share. Praise the Lord. God heals our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups. It's good to meet uh, Alan's parents this morning when they came in. Um, how do we take this step? How do I commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control? Let me just share four things with you. Number one, I accept God's word as my standard for living. From now on, I've got a manual that I'm going to live by. Not rules and regulations, but guidelines, directives from the God who loves me, who, 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 who created this world, the God of all wisdom. A while back, I saw a t-shirt that said, this life is a test. It's only a test. Had it been a real life, you would have been given an instruction manual to tell you what to do. Well, fortunately, God has seen to it that we have his wisdom. He's opened his mind to us. This is the standard by which we evaluate life. It says all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and it teaches us to do what is right. Not just to do what morally right, but to do what is right for us, what God wants us to be. Secondly, I accept God's will as my strategy. I'm committing my will to Him. That my, God's will becomes my goal in life. So the first thing in the morning, this is the day that the Lord has made. Another day to fulfill His purpose in my life. God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? In the Bible, it says, God, uh, it says that David said, I delight to do your will. That same scripture was quoted of Jesus. Jesus came into this world and he said, I delight to do your will, O God. Jesus told us, seek first his will, his kingdom, his righteousness. So God's will becomes my strategy for life. And each morning I go to his word and to discover his will. Now a lot of people try to make that very, you know, deep. Well, what's God's will for my breakfast this morning? Where's God want me to, you know, things like that. But see, it's not rocket science. You guys from Martin uh, Lockheed, you just realize the Bible's not rocket science, all right? It's very simple. You know what it says? Whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Love him supremely. First in your life, above every other love. Trust him completely. 
because you know how much he loves you and obey him wholeheartedly take this word as your will for as god's will for your life and then thirdly i accept god's power as my strength see that's the only way you can live god's will in your life is when you accept god's power as your strength philippians 4 13 says i can do everything god asks of me with the help of christ who gives me the strength and the power you're never going to read anything in here that you can't do because god says i will give you the power to do everything i ask of you No longer do I have to rely on my own energy. Remember the principle last week? Things work better when they're plugged in. How many times have you gone to the uh, troubleshooting section? I I had to do that this week. Troubleshooting section on my computer. And the very first thing it says, make sure the computer is plugged in to a power source. Things just work better when they're plugged in. And God made you and me to not run on our own power. We've got to be plugged in to him. We've got to be plugged into him true willpower we can't do it willpower will not do it for us true willpower is your willingness to accept god's power see you don't need human willpower what you need is the willingness to accept god's power in your life to give him control that's the thing because i accept god's word as my standard god's will as my strategy i want god's power as my strength and now I accept God's Son as my Savior. See, if you've never done that, remember I said there's an initial time. August 28th, 1972 was the time I initially said for the very first time, I need Jesus' power in my life. And I committed my life and my will to the care and control of Christ on August 28th, 1972. And I was buried with Christ in baptism at a quarry at the University of Missouri. And I came up out of that water absolutely new all my past was washed away and i was a new creature in christ i had him living within me jesus said anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved to believe means to commit as much of yourself as you understand right now to as much of christ as you understand at this moment i want to ask you to take step three this week I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to his care and control. Step three. I would encourage you to get on your knees before God. Not right here today. But get on your knees before God this week and do that every morning. Make that decision. But I do want you to make that decision right now. You can't do it on your own. You can't manage life on your own, by your own power, by your own wisdom. God created you. He knows you through and through, and he loves you. He cares about you, and he knows all about you. He knows exactly what's best for you. He knows exactly what you need, just like you feel like you do with your children. Only he really does, and he has the power to help you. He wants to manage your life if you'll take this step and give him the care and control of your life. So, whether you've said this once or whether you've said this a thousand times, I'd like for you to say that. I want to give my life. Let's put that up on the screen so everybody can read that. Can you find that? I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. How many of you have that memorized? Raise your hand high if you've got it memorized. Several of you do. I consciously choose... How many of you will make that commitment right now? Would you raise your hands? Would you just stand and let's say that together? Let's consciously choose to commit your life and your will. And don't, don't stand just because everybody else is standing. But if you, you know, I don't want to, we're not, we're not sheep that have to be led or have to follow everybody else. I mean, we're sheep. We have to be led, but we don't have to follow everybody else. So if you really are sincere and you want to consciously choose to commit all your life to Christ's care and control, let's say that together. I consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Now let me just pray for you. Father, I thank you for those who in their hearts have sincerely meant that they're committing their life to you. 
their life and their will to your care and control. I thank you most of all, Lord, for what you are beginning to do in each of our lives, beginning from this day, because every day is new as a believer. I thank you for what you're beginning to do as you have promised to continually work in our lives to change us, to transform us, to make us into your image. Lord, that's our goal, that we would be like Jesus, that we would be mature and complete, that we would love you supremely, trust you completely, and obey you wholeheartedly. And so I pray for each of these, Father, that they will take your word as their standard, your will as their goal that they would that they would just love you lord with all their heart and soul that they would take your truth as their mantle father work in the hearts and the lives of each of these who are here may they take your power and receive your power that gives us the power to do everything that you've asked us to do. In Jesus' name. Now, I just want to ask you while you're still standing, is there anybody here that made that commitment for the first time? You've never given the care and control of your life to Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here? If you are, then you need to be baptized. Remember what I said faith is? Faith is responding to what Jesus says. It's our response. And so I'd like for you to be baptized today. If you've made that commitment, seal that commitment by being baptized into Christ. We're going to sing this song of invitation. We have the baptistry ready, and we have, uh, we have towels back there. We have hair dryers. We have uh, robes you can put on. You don't need to have anything here. But if you made that commitment for the first time, would you just meet me down here at the front? I'll have one of the staff members take you to the baptistry, and we'll, we'll let you... Make that first step of faith in Christ today. Would you come as we